Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is paper 2C of January 2021. Let's take a look at the question. So the first question says, the diagram shows an atom of an element. What is the name of the particle labeled Y? Of course, the particle labeled Y, that's the positive particle in the nucleus, so that is proton. Give the mass number of this atom. How do we get the mass number? We add up everything in the nucleus. So you can see that we have three positives and four neutrons. That means a total of seven. Name this element. So you need to look for what in the periodic table? You need to look for the element that has an atomic number three because this is what identifies the element. So you want to look for the element that has a small number three, atomic number three, that is lithium. There are two isotopes of this element. Give one way in terms of subatomic particles. Remember, subatomic particles just means protons, neutrons, electrons, that these isotopes are the same and one way that they are different. So we know that isotopes have the same what? They have the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. This question is about gases, and he says, name the most abundant gas in the Earth's atmosphere. You know that the Earth's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. Name the gas that is a compound. Which of these is a compound? That's carbon dioxide. Name the least reactive of these gases. Of course, the least reactive is the one in group zero, so that is argon. Name the gas formed by complete combustion of hydrocarbons. Of course, complete combustion will give carbon dioxide. Then he says, describe the test for hydrogen gas. What was the test for hydrogen gas? Insert a lighted splint it pops this question is about carboxylic acid solutions of carboxylic acids react with magnesium metal to form hydrogen gas a student uses this apparatus to investigate the time taken to produce 10 centimeter cubed of gas from different carboxylic acids so what he's doing is he's reacting magnesium with different carboxylic acids and determining how much time does it need to collect 10 centimeter cubed of gas? This is the student's method. Pour some carboxylic acid solution into a conical flask. Add some magnesium powder. Quickly connect the gas syringe and start a timer. Record the time taken to collect 10 centimeter cubed of hydrogen gas. And the student repeats this with three other carboxylic acids. Now, all the carboxylic acids are of the same concentration. Give two other variables the student should control in his investigation. What should be the same in each experiment? You should realize that they should use the same volume of acid, the same temperature, or the same mass of magnesium. Any two of these would be correct. Give a reason why it's important to connect the gas syringe quickly. Remember that we connect the gas syringe quickly to avoid leaking of the gas out of the apparatus or uh, so that uh, only as little as possible of the gas can leak out of the apparatus. The table shows the student's results and he says calculate the average time for propanoic acid to produce 10 centimeter cube. Now, propanoic acid, they repeated the experiment four times. Once he got 69, once 93, once 70, once 71. So what is the average? Remember, if one of them is anomalous, you cannot include it in the average. So you cannot just add all of them and divide by four. Because obviously, one of them is anomalous, the one with 93 seconds this is way different from the others. The others are very near to 70. So I ignore the 93. I take the average of the other three experiments, and that comes out to be 70 seconds. Deduce the relationship between number of carbon atoms in the molecule and the time taken to produce the 10 centimeter cubed of gas. 
obviously as you can see methanoic acid one carbon it needed 49 seconds ethanoic needed 61 seconds propanoic was what we calculated it needed 70 seconds butanoic it needed 83 so obviously the more the number of carbon atoms the longer the time taken to uh, collect 10 centimeter cube an ester is formed by adding ethanoic acid to ethanol of course you should remember that the conditions for forming an ester is sulfuric acid as a catalyst give the displayed formula of the ester produced when ethanoic acid reacts with ethanol so he wants you to draw how do we draw an ester remember ethanoic acid is that first one on the left two carbons and acid has c double bond o single bond oh ethanol is something also with two carbons but it has an oh now in order to form the ester i need to join it okay this is how i join it I remove the OH from the acid, the H from the alcohol, and I join. If he's asking for the name, now this is the answer, he just wants the formula. But if he's asking for the name, we said, how do we name the ester? We said we start with the alcohol. The alcohol is ethanol, so that is ethyl. The acid was ethanoic, so it is ethyl ethanoic. Are we following? This question is about sodium and potassium. A trough is filled with water and a few drops of phenolphthalein indicator are added. A small piece of sodium is dropped into the water. One of the products of the reaction is an alkali. And he says, complete the equation for the reaction of sodium with water. Obviously, what we need is the state symbols and the balancing. So you should realize sodium, of course, is a solid. Water, he already says, is the liquid. Sodium hydroxide is aqueous. And then we need to balance. So that is two sodiums and four hydrogens and two oxygen. Identify the ion that causes the solution to become alkaline. You should know that any solution is alkaline due to the presence of OH minus. This is OH minus or hydroxide ion. Give three observations that would be made when sodium reacts with water. What happens if I put a piece of sodium in water? You should realize that, first of all, you should have bubbles of gas because, of course, we said it gives hydrogen gas. And sodium is in group one, so sodium floats. It darts or moves around on the surface of the water. It will also melt and disappear because it is reacting. Explain why potassium is more reactive than sodium. Refer to the electronic configurations of the atoms. So if we draw electronic configuration of potassium, it is 2881. Sodium is 281. So the difference between them is that in potassium, the outer electron is further away from the nucleus. So there is less attraction force between the outer electron and the nucleus. And that means that that electron is more easily lost in potassium than in sodium. Please, when you're answering these questions, please specify what you're talking about. Don't just say it and the examiner can, does not understand the it uh, refers to potassium or sodium. Um, this question is about metal. Aluminium is malleable. So he's saying explain why aluminium is malleable. Remember, any uh, metal is malleable because layers of positive ions can slide over each other when heated or hot. Explain why aluminium conducts electricity. Why does any metal conduct electricity? Because it has delocalized electrons that are free to move. Remember, metals conduct electricity because they have free moving electrons. Aluminium cannot be extracted by heating a mixture of carbon and aluminium oxide. Give a reason why heating a mixture of aluminium oxide and carbon does not produce aluminium. Of course, that is because of the reactivity. We said anything that is more reactive than carbon cannot be displaced by it. So aluminium oxide will not react with carbon because aluminium is more reactive than carbon and it will not be displaced by carbon. 
Aluminium is extracted industrially by electrolysis of molten aluminium oxide at a temperature of this and so on. And he says, explain how aluminium metal forms at the negative electrode. Remember that aluminium metal is a positive, uh, aluminium is a positive ion, so it is attracted to the negative electrode. And when it goes to the negative electrode, it gains electrons. So it becomes aluminium atoms or aluminium metal. Write an ionic equation for the formation of oxygen gas at the positive electrode. Remember, the O2 minus goes to the positive, gives electrons or loses electrons, becomes O2. And that means we need to balance it. And uh, please note the balance. So just why carbon dioxide gas is also produced at the positive. Remember that when we're doing this electrolysis, the electrodes are made of carbon. So when we form oxygen gas at the electrode, then the carbon in the electrode reacts with the oxygen gas produced. This forms carbon dioxide gas, and we said that is why the anode needs to be replaced from time to time. Aluminium reacts with iron 3 oxide, and he's saying that the reaction is exothermic. State how this reaction shows that iron 3 oxide is reduced. Of course, the iron 3 oxide lost oxygen since it changed to iron, so that is reduction. Draw an energy level diagram for the reaction. He's saying it's exo. So, exothermic means that the reactants lost heat, and that means the products will have less energy than the reactants, and the difference in energy is the delta H. This question is about insoluble salt silver chloride. Silver chloride can be made by the reaction between copper chloride and silver nitrate. Describe how a student could prepare a pure dry sample of silver chloride, starting with copper chloride and silver nitrate solution. So he's starting with the two solutions and he's trying to prepare an insoluble salt. So of course, what happens is we add the two solutions and stir using a glass rod. The silver chloride is formed as a white precipitate. That is what we want. So we filter through filter paper and funnel. The precipitate is collected as a residue. Wash the residue with a few drops of distilled water and dry between filter papers. A student investigates the quantity of silver chloride produced when different volumes of silver nitrate solution are added to copper chloride solution. This is the student's method. Pour 5 cm cubed of copper chloride solution to a test tube. Add 1 cm cubed of silver nitrate solution to the test tube. Allow silver chloride precipitate to settle and measure the height of the precipitate. So what he's doing is he's going to repeat this with different volumes of silver nitrate solution. He gives the table. So what we need to do is we need to plot the student's results and draw two straight lines of best fit. So when we plot, of course, we use small x's. And then he's saying we should draw two straight lines. So we need to draw this. And we ignore the anomalous result. So just a mistake the student made to cause the anomalous result. Of course, he either did not allow the precipitate to settle long enough, or he did not add enough silver nitrate solution so that's why he got a result away from the straight line give a reason why the last three heights are the same why is it that he doesn't get any more precipitate at the end this is because at the end all the copper chloride was used up and the silver nitrate that he was adding was excess the equation for the reaction between copper chloride and silver nitrate is this. A student measures this volume and this concentration of copper chloride, reacts it with silver nitrate. And first of all, he says, name a piece of apparatus suitable 
for measuring 25 centimeter cubed of copper chloride. Of course, we use uh, pipette to measure 25.0 centimeter cubed. If you say burette also, that could be correct. Calculate the maximum mass in grams of silver chloride that could be produced. So what do we have? We have information about copper chloride, so we get the number of moles of copper chloride. Of course, that's concentration times volume, and the volume has to be divided by 1,000. Then we look at the equation, and we compare the number of moles of copper chloride to what he's asking about, which is the uh, silver chloride. So from the equation, one mole of copper chloride gives two moles of silver chloride, that means the number of moles of silver chloride is twice of that, and then I can get the mass, the mass is number of moles times the MR of silver chloride. In an experiment using different solutions, the mass of silver chloride produced is this, and the maximum mass of silver chloride that could be produced is this. So he already calculated that he should get 0.85. But what he actually got is 0.744. So to get the percent yield, it is what he actually got over what he should get times 100. This question is about octane, which is produced in the gasoline fraction. And he says, describe how crude oil is separated into fractions in the fractionating column. What happens here to the crude oil? You should know crude oil is heated and vaporized. Then it is cooled and condensed in the fractionating towel. And remember that you have to mention that the fractions with lower number of carbons, lower boiling point are collected at the top to indicate that you have different uh, fractions, different boiling points. Octane can also be produced by cracking. Give the conditions for cracking. What were the conditions for cracking? Remember we said cracking is breaking down of long chain hydrocarbons into shorter chains. What were the conditions? 600 to 700 degrees Celsius and aluminum oxide catalyst or alumina. A car is driven at constant speed for 4 kilometers. The exhaust gases are collected and their volume at room temperature and pressure is this. Now, the exhaust gases include carbon dioxide and oxides of nitrogen. The carbon dioxide is removed. The volume of the remaining gases is this. So, first of all, explain how oxides of nitrogen form in a car engine. You should know how the oxides of nitrogen form in a car engine. This is due to nitrogen and oxygen in the air around the engine, reacting due to the high temperature in the engine. This forms oxides of nitrogen. So remember, the high temperature in the engine causes nitrogen and oxygen in the air around the engine to react. Give a reason why oxides of nitrogen should not be released into the atmosphere. What is bad about oxides of nitrogen? Remember, they cause what? They cause acid rain that causes all of this. The acid rain dissolves buildings, kills plants and marine animals, and damages the lungs. Show that the car produces less than 100 gram of carbon dioxide per kilometer. Let's take a look at what he said. He said the car went for 4 kilometers. The exhaust gases total have this volume. When he removed carbon dioxide, it became 2.96 times 10 to the 5. So you can get the volume of carbon dioxide from the difference. From that, you can get number of moles, volume over 24. And then you can get the mass, but this is the mass in 4 kilometers. He wants it per kilometer. So dividing by 4 you get this mass per gram per kilometer. And that's the end of this paper. Um, please revise all of this, and thank you for listening.